to It Is So Good to Have You Back. Welcome to The Well with Shan. And I consider it a very special treat for me personally, but also for you folks, because like I said, I've got some great people in my world that I want to introduce you to. And right here is one of them. And her name is Camille Hallstrom. Huzzah, huzzah. Thank you, I'm very shy. <laughs> Not. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This lady is the professor of theater, and uh, she is at, at an unnamed college. Yes, yes. <laughs> on a campus. We who is not to be named. Far, far away. And, Galaxy, uh, far. Never mind. <laughs> Edit. <laughs> and uh, we are um, hoping to talk a bit tonight about just singleness. But before we do, mm -hmm. you are not only a professor of theater. Mm -hmm. You do lots of other things. So would you tell me just a little bit and tell the audience mm. some of your other life? Other stuff. Um, I, uh, I also have a seminary degree in theology. So most summers when we don't have pandemics on, um, since 96, I, I've gone to work in Uganda and other places in East Africa, South Sudan, um, working for the local church there. Uh, I'm doing, among other things, clergy training. So um, I kinda, I'm kind i kind of a dual personality. I do the drama here, I do the theology over there, and then I try to integrate them a bit in both places. Are you saying you have multiple personalities? That would be for you to say. Okay. I am not a psychological professional. <laughs> I'm teasing, of course. Now, um, I've heard stories of your time on the other continent, mm -hmm. which are just... Uh, we could do a whole episode, mm. really. Let's, let's. <laughs> <laughs> that will be part two and part three and part four. Um, tonight's topic, however, is mm. not good to be on Africa. Mm -hmm. It's going to be on singleness. Mm -hmm. And you are a single female. Last time I checked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, we like to have fun. <laughs> Um, so Camille, in all seriousness mm -hmm. here, if that's going to be hard for us to do, yeah. um, I would love for you just to kind of tell our, our audience and kind of set the stage mm -hmm. for, um, how did you get here? Um, did, did you know when you are, were a young mm -hmm. person that you might be single someday mm -hmm. or how did, how do you historically look back and kind of see? Mm -hmm. How this happened. Do you mean, did I hear a voice from heaven saying, you have a vocation to singleness? Yes. That did not happen. You did not hear the voice of God. No, but I do think I have a vocation to singleness. And the way I know that is because I never got married <laughs> and I'm almost 60. And, you know, I, I suppose I could still get married someday, but I've had close to 60 years of life that presumably I'm I was supposed to serve God in the midst of my singleness. Um, I, uh, I didn't plan on it. I assumed when I was a kid, I hoped when I was a kid that I was going to be married. Um, but, uh, you know, as the years went on and on and on and, um, you know, I, I've, I've never been on a date except for one that was an accident. And oh. we can talk about that later <laughs> if, you, if you want. But, I mean, I, you know, I, I've had people ask, well, so why didn't you ever get married? And you can't marry thin air. So if that's not the hand of God, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. And since, since Scripture talks about, um, and J Jesus says in Matthew 19, you know, some people are born eunuchs, some are made eunuchs, some uh, choose to live as eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, and not everybody can accept this teaching, but those who can should. Mm. Um, even if I didn't want to be single, I sure know how to be single after almost 60 years of practice at it. And, and so it seems to me that was a call. Mm -hmm. You obey God where you are, mm -hmm. as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, you know, if you're married, don't seek don't to... try to be not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're not married, I really wish you would consider being single like me, because it's easier to serve God that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
Now, yeah. now let's pull this mm -hmm. part a little yeah. bit because the two passages that you have just mentioned about the eunuchs and then the, the first Corinthians mm -hmm. 7 passage, we just rarely hear mm -hmm. talked about in, in church and, and by church, I mean church universal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm We've both been around the block a little bit in some in some different church mm -hmm. ministries, um, but we never quite hear that teased out and, mm -hmm. and pulled apart. So, give me an idea of why you think that might be, and then you, you extrapolate, if you will, mm -hmm. on those two concepts. I think if we lived in a different time and place, we would have heard more about it, and perhaps so, perhaps to a fault. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we would have probably, if we'd lived in the early or medieval part of the church, we may have heard virginity almost treated like a better virtue than others. Mm. Um, and I don't think that's scriptural, but um, I do think that they took the possibility of people being called to singleness much more seriously and created communities that pe people could live in to do their ministry out of and have support for daily life and sickness and old age and all that sort of thing. My sense is that in the Protestant church, at least, um, it may be an overreaction to um, errors of emphasis in early medieval Christianity to uh, the, the importance of virginity or requiring uh, celibacy and clergy, which, which scripture does not. In the Reformation, I think when they were trying to pull back some wrong over emphases, mm. I think we may have shot too far in the other direction. Which we often yeah. tend to do yeah. with these mm -hmm. cycles, yeah. And then I think also, too, at least in terms of the evangelical Protestant church now, um, with, with the advent of the sexual revolution in the West, um, I think there was probably a bit of a circle the wagons mentality. We we got to keep the wife and kids safe from from profligacy. And and I'm not saying that we ought not to have them, but I think again in the in the focus on that, there may have been an overemphasis. You you have probably heard a lot. People have probably heard a lot. The word family used almost as a synonym for Christian, mm. like family entertainment. Yeah or a radio station that's safe for the whole family. family. And and I do think family life, is, family life is important. And I do think the sexual revolution and other things in Western culture have endangered family life. And we, we see a lot of fractured marriages and kids hurt by that and so forth. But the church, I think, in the midst of these two things, I think maybe an overreaction coming out of the Protestant, out of the Reformation, and uh, an overreaction coming out of finding themselves in a in a sexually what's what's the word I want revolted <laughs> you know what I mean a, a culture influenced by the sexual revolution um, lost an emphasis that the New Testament clearly has mm -hmm. and it's an important New Testament emphasis because it was so unusual mm -hmm. coming out of Old Testament Judaism okay yeah. so uh, in that culture of course. Mm -hmm. You see it all over the Old Testament where Leah or, or Rachel or these women, for instance, mm -hmm. weren't um, given fertility at a mm -hmm. time and their whole essence of identity yeah. is completely and crumbled. Sarah and Hannah and yeah. It just yeah. goes on and on. And and, and the in Isaiah fifty four, the barren woman, there's a prophecy for the barren woman and a few mm -hmm. chapters later there's a prophecy for the eunuch. Don't just say I'm a dry tree because it was so humiliating yeah and uh, you're saying that is partially because judaism was established mm -hmm. as first and foremost be part of this family and and bear fruit and reap or at least that's how it came to be viewed now we could argue whether or not that's what the scripture requires mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but i in uh in judaism at least second simple temple second temple judaism and later it, I, whether it was the case before or, or not, I don't know. But it's it's been understood that to choose to remain single, to not have children on purpose, is a sin. Mm. Judaism, wow. or at least you know, significant uh, schools in Judaism, I don't even know if that's the right word, but um, have taken that first 
um, I think what we Christians would call blessing in uh, Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. They take it as the first command of Scripture. Interesting. Yeah. And you can you can find similar things in Islam, Mormonism. You you want you want to. Um, you want to be a god? You have to have a celestial marriage in the temple, and, so, and no singleness. So, yeah, so singleness, and, and and then we'll back up too. In, in the Old Testament, the covenant, among other things, promised inheritance of the land. Mm -hmm. That was part of the visible blessing of God for those covenant people. Yes. Well, how do how do you have inheritance if you don't have kids? So, so if you don't have kids, it's and, and, and this is a group of people who maybe were not entirely certain that there was such a thing as eternal life after death. So mm -hmm. visible blessing in this life mm -hmm. was important. Mm -hmm. And yeah. where you're going with mm -hmm. this is that that's the culture that Jesus came to. Yes. And he says what and why is it so profound? Well, for one thing, he himself is not married. He's, he's going around as a rabbi and he's not married. Um, but then he's the one who says, he, you may recall the, the debate with the Pharisees. They want to know, you know, can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? And he says, uh, have you read uh, the book of Genesis? <laughs> and, you know, he says, God made the male and female, and that's why uh, they come together. A man leaves his mother and, uh, man leaves his father and mother and joins with his wife and they become one flesh. And what God has brought together, no one should put asunder. And the disciples are shocked. Yes. His, 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 his dudes hang with him. His, his boys hanging with him. Like, and they say what they think is is hyperbole. They say, well, if that's the case, a man shouldn't get married at all. They're joking. And he says, now here's a thought. <laughs> <laughs> that right there. He says, yeah. He says, not everybody can accept this teaching. Some are born eunuchs. Some are made eunuchs by other people. And some, presumably like Jesus, choose to live as eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom mm -hmm. the one who can accept this teaching should mm -hmm. and i could imagine if there was a video camera there at the time you would see the disciples jaws on the ground and the pharisees would probably just be thinking this it's another it's another near heretical statement from jesus it's bewildering because mm -hmm. there's no mental construct mm -hmm. to draw from mm -hmm. with this with this yeah. is what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah that's really powerful mm -hmm. Tell us, how would you describe your journey? Let's let's make this more personal for mm -hmm. a moment. Um, you, you mentioned earlier you're almost 60 years old. Mm -hmm. You've lived this life away from family. You are a Pennsylvanian, mm -hmm. and you've been in Chattanooga. 31 years. Right. So mind tell if, me. Do you mind this, if I drink on camera? It's, it's just water. <laughs> Tell me what the journey has has been like for you. What words would you describe? Um, I do believe God brought me here. I, I didn't make plans. If I had time to go into that story, it's kind of astonishing how I, I think He plopped me here. Um, and in this particular church that we're both familiar with, I, I've been in this same church for 31 years, and um, I have considered it to be the family I have in town. I don't have siblings here. I don't have kids. Um, and I, when I first came to the church, <coughs> excuse me, I thought, oh, yeah, look, look at the work they're doing. This is, this is a church that I know that if, when, and if I should ever need help, um, they will be there for me. And that, alas, hasn't been my experience over the years. And, um, and I could go into to some details about that, but I don't know that I need to, and given the time on, on this podcast I probably can't but um, I do think and it's probably not just this particular church I think probably a lot of mission oriented churches <coughs> excuse me with an outward focus who are trying to counterbalance what we can see in a lot of other Western or American churches which have a whole lot of inward focus mm -hmm. uh, trying trying to balance that because christ says we should be going out and making disciples and caring for the poor instead of just having really swell youth groups and family programs and stuff for us inside the house um i think there can be a tendency to do either or and not both but we're yes. supposed to do both right um we are supposed to do good to all men 
starting first with the household of faith. Especially yeah. the household of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I also think because we live in American culture, which, as we all know, is highly individual individualized, and um, in in a way that I I think is probably almost unique in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even even within like the last fifty years, when, when I grew up. Um, you could you still find people sitting on their front porches to cool off. Well, I'm, I'm a Yankee, so nobody has air conditioning up there, but more and more people now have that. But you just sit on your front porch because it's hot, and then you say hello to your neighbors. And before everybody and his brother had a car, you would just walk places, and you would say hello to your neighbors. And as, as our culture has progressed in the direction that it has, so we're all sitting inside and watching our own private TVs and our own private air conditioning right. on our own private phones and going from here to there in our own private cars. So we've um, lost community. We've lost community. And so we have community in our own individual houses. Mm. Um, and because the church rightly is concerned about fracturing marriages and the impact that has on children, children of divorce suffer greatly and yes. so on and so forth, I think perhaps in the focus to help marriages be strong and healthy and the fact that as a culture now, whether we noticed it about ourselves or not, we are hyper individualized mm -hmm. in ways that people in previous generations just had of just casually running into people. And so mm -hmm. I have a relationship with you whether I want to or not. Right. And you think about the small village church, mm -hmm. you know, and think of any British murder mystery you've ever read. <laughs> the small village where everybody knows each other whether they want to or not. And there's the cranky old single lady on the corner and she's hard to put up with, but I, I have to, you know, she goes to the same church as me. And, and, and But when she's sick with the flu, everybody knows too, because we all live together. We all know each other's business. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think we've lost that unless unless we consciously strive to find ways to be countercultural. Mm. We we will not only be leaving some people falling through the cracks, um, the single, the shut in, the, the so forth, people who don't easily fit into social structures that. Yeah. The church the tends to do, of yeah, the family, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, unless we consciously think about ways to push to be countercultural, um, we're going to to not be doing congregational care mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And so, as a single person, I, I have my friends in the church, but most of my buds, maybe all of them, are married. Mm -hmm. or widowed. And, and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe married people just sort of assume that, well, you know, when I was in my 20s or whenever it was before I was married, you know, I, I had my pals and we would go out and we would hang out because together. Because everybody was single like yeah. them at the time. Yeah. And then you got married and your life changed. And so anyway, all of that is to say it's not as easy for me to have continuing deep relationships with people as it might have been when we were all single and in our 20s. Mm -hmm. And then you add to that the fact that some of us, oh, say even theater professors, might not be very good at doing social life. Mm -hmm. um, so God forbid you might not know how to make yeah. the social connection mm -hmm. of some sort. Yeah. Now you've used the word countercultural several mm -hmm. times just now in, in this description. Mm -hmm. And I would love to bring in this extra element because you're, you're speaking of the individualism of America mm -hmm. and how we have progressively moved toward a loner status mm -hmm. inside our homes. But you have this whole other half of your life mm -hmm. that isn't spent on this continent. Mm -hmm. And that is not an individualistic society mm -hmm. and culture. So tell me what you see there, mm -hmm. because I think that's really fascinating that yeah. you, you get to have the contrast. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I've been working in East Africa for, it, it, except for the pandemic, and, you know, a few years here and there. I didn't go, um, 20, 25 years. Um, and uh, I have assumed uh, that when I retire, that might be a place that I retire. Mm. Because you might think, well, well the health is not as good there and, and aren't you gonna suffer and so forth. Well, it's true, the health care is better here, or at least the potential health care is better here. The, the, better here, the care, people care, 
is better there. Mm -hmm. So it's like, which do you want? Do you mm -hmm. want to have uh, the potential for getting, you know, some really highfalutin medical procedure done on you at a cost that will bankrupt you when you're 75 yes. here in America? Or would you like to be with people who actually care for you and therefore, by the way, in that way might help you to have a better <laughs> a better level of health anyway. You know, I, I don't have the numbers with me, but I, I think I mentioned to you not too long ago, I, you know that over the years I, I have struggled to get diagnosed and treated some long-standing kind of chronic yes. fatigue issue. And it's, it's, it's not even diagnosed. I, I've been to MDs, I've been to alternative practitioners, and all of them find me puzzling. They, they don't say I'm a hypochondriac. They, just find me puzzling. They don't know what to do. And it just it just hit me relatively recently, and probably as a result of my experience during the pandemic. Um, I, I don't know if the absolute cause of my fatigue is this, but certainly a contributing factor to my fatigue is I live alone. Mm. And, um, and this is where I said I, I don't have the numbers, but the, the numbers do show that single people die sooner than married people. Wow. And um, if I were to live in Uganda, where the people I work with treat me like family, um, I live in their home, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's there's mutual support, you know, I, I don't have to do everything alone, I don't have to do all my own cooking and clothes washing and this and that. Um, I dare say that the kind of stress, which I just take for granted as part of everyday living here in the US, that is part of living alone and have do everything, do everything on my own, that gets lessened in that context. Now, of course, there are other kinds of stressors, but all of that is to say, um, I have more personal care there more sense of personal belonging. Indeed, I think this is an interesting story. Over the years, as I struggled with um, chronic illness, there was a time, for example, that I wasn't in church for like nine months mm. and nobody seemed to notice. However, my Ugandan friends, my African friends did know. And you were here yes. while you were <laughs> yes. sick. And I, a couple times, uh, a bishop, he was a bishop then, he's now the archbishop of the whole country, but. He called me a couple of times to pray for me. And, and another pastor, the, the man I chiefly work with over there, um, sent a message to the church, this one here, saying, Camille, sick, get somebody over there, which I didn't know happened at the time. And I found out a year later he told me. Um, but I would never have known unless you told me because mm -hmm. nothing happened. And that makes him crazy because in his context, he can't even imagine that. Mm. and it would just be a, a mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. so you're naming some things that are really beautiful living together mm -hmm. phone calls mm -hmm. washing and doing tasks together mm -hmm. meals together this starts to give us some kind of picture mm -hmm. of the kinds of things that sound family or feel family mm -hmm. feel like mm -hmm. personal care to you yeah um, I know we don't have all the answers sitting here tonight, but I am wondering would would the stigmas that are in American culture that we are are talking about here um and with the lack of definition and structure to know how to bypass all of this individualism, you have kind of indicated that Protestants. Are, are reacting and we don't do this well because mm -hmm. we don't have a good theology for it. Mm -hmm. Tell me what the alternatives are. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about African culture mm -hmm. alternative. I mean, not everybody who's religious does it this <laughs> way. So let's talk about those people. Um, first of all, I do want to say this. I am a member of my own culture. So even if I can kind of de daydream about different ways of doing this. It doesn't mean that it would necessarily be easy for me to, this, this is gonna take group creative thought and a willingness to do things in a way that will make us uncomfortable for a while mm -hmm. till we find a, a new groove. But um, I, I do think, for example, um, the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church historically have already 
just assumed they're going to have single people in their midst, mm. eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. And so there have been, from the beginning, structures like that, the monastery, the convent. Now, that's not to say there haven't been some um, misuses of those things. Sure, and so forth. good but, has a dark side. Yeah. But the point is, if you're going to have people who don't have families for the sake of the kingdom, then the church, who is their family, needs to find a way to help them live. Mm. Um, and I, I think pro probably Protestants are more used to thinking about certain categories of that, like widows, orphans. Um, you know, if, if you think about, all right, how does a woman support herself in, in the Bible? Well, mostly she doesn't. I mean, there are, ex there are exceptions, like Lydia is a businesswoman and so forth. But generally, you're going to live in your father's household. And so that's where you get your food and clothes, and then you do your job, your work there, or or you're married and you're in your husband's household. And if you're divorced, you might go back to your father's household. Um, but if you live with your husband for a long time and you're widowed, and maybe your father isn't alive anymore once you're widowed, then you're in trouble mm. because you don't have the visible means of support. That's why the church comes in to support. Mm -hmm. And the orphan who doesn't have a father now has... Uh, the church comes in to support, not because there's something so unusual about mm -hmm. this subgroup called widows and orphans. They are just people who don't have structures in culture by which they can easily live. Mm -hmm. So the church now steps up. Well, if Paul's not going to say it's good to remain single, um, how is that person going to live? I I can't live in my father's house anymore. And indeed, once God gave me the job I have here, and I do believe God gave it to me 31 years ago, I was instantly not living in my father's house. Um, if this were a different time and place where I couldn't draw such a good paycheck as I do now, I would need the church, if they are going to be the family to me that they often claim they are, to find a way to make sure that our sister is able to pay your bills mm -hmm. and not lonely at holidays or you know, all the stuff you would do with a blood a true single sister blood relative yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely that's mm -hmm. really good so i'm imagining the vulnerability that you're speaking of mm -hmm. um with aging mm -hmm. um was pretty horrific during the pandemic mm -hmm. can you tell me just a, a little bit about that because um between lockdowns and, and social isolating, to a person who's already socially isolated, mm -hmm. what did that look like? Um, it was really hard, though it actually took me a while to realize what a hit I was taking to my both my emotional health and my physical health, partly because I'm used to being alone. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it didn't look really unusual, but as month after month after month went by, and I, I, in a high risk group, I'm overweight, so I really did not need to be going out in unsafe places. And of course, church wasn't meeting. I, I hadn't quite realized, I think, how dependent I was on at least going to church weekly and getting a hug. Um, mm. And even at school, you know, I'm a teacher. I love being with my students. Um, but even that was socially distant. So though there was a kind of contact, the, the kind of physical or just buddy in your in your space kind of contact you just take for granted and aren't thinking yes. about it so wasn't no there touch. yeah yeah i do i do have a friend but but she has an immunocompromised husband so she's had to be very very careful too but <laughs> she bought a uh, um a shower curtain <laughs> <laughs> so when when the weather was warm and we could meet outside on her deck i, I could get a plasticized hug now and again. A plasticized yes. hug. <laughs> but you know, over time, and once the weather changed, that just didn't happen anymore. And um, mm -hmm. so anyway, for a, for a good 14 months, in addition to the extra stress at school, trying to, trying to reinvent our program so we could even yes. function, mm -hmm. um, which was extra difficult. And then, you know, I, I am single, so I pay to have people touch me. I get massage. I go to acupuncture. I couldn't do that for 14 months. So right. as the time went by, I realized I wasn't coping well. I, I, I would manage to get through my week of work, and then I'd go home and cry on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I didn't really have a whole lot of places to turn, you know. And I also felt like I was giving out continually and not getting in. Mm -hmm. Both because, you know, I'm a teacher, blah, blah, blah. But um, 
you know, I know a lot of people who lost family. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people who um, were suffering because of the Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd stuff going on. I know yeah. a lot of people who were suffering about the political bickering back and forth and the bickering about, uh, you know, Trump and Biden or there is a pandemic and there is a... And I sort of the almost coming in. Yeah. yeah and I, I sort of felt myself the way the way I try to reach people anyway, even if there is not a pandemic, is I kind of try to speak to people in social media. I kind of try to be the voice <laughs> bringing two sides together. And I, I just realized in retrospect, I was purely exhausted. And so mm -hmm. I given my physical health issues, but also I, I have a history of some depression and so forth. I realized that a lot of ground I had made in the past, I lost a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. And um, I have even this summer since school uh, let out, I have, I have been exhausted. I just went to the doctor last week to say, why can't I do anything? And, and in addition to, she thinks I have, I'm still trying to get over the cook. COVID vaccine, she thinks quite possibly because I was so stressed and depleted from a year of being alone. That's why I reacted so badly to the COVID vaccine. So um, there are real, there are real human consequences yes. to that being alone, even if I'm good at being alone, which I am, mm -hmm. um, but, but not that good, not that good. <laughs> and even, even if you came over to my house and said, I'm fine. I, I would need somebody to say, no, honey, I don't care if you are fine. You can't do this. Mm -hmm. And in reality, you're not fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And and that being okay. Yeah. So I'm hearing that this has impacted your physical health. Mm -hmm. It's impacted your mental health. Mm -hmm. um, you've had lots of continuing giving out, not not much giving in. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's had big consequences on you mm -hmm. um, all the way around. For the person who's out there who they've been married 30, 40 years, or, you know, this is just not even on their radar. Mm -hmm. Part of what we're wanting to do is to communicate to them that this is a um, vital piece mm -hmm. of ministerial church body life. Mm -hmm. And trying to just kind of raise the awareness of, of the reality. What, what would you want to say that maybe you haven't already said, just kind of in closing? Um, I do think if we're going to stand up in the pulpit on Sunday and say to each other, we're family, then we need to make sure that that's actually true and it's not just a catchphrase or we're not actually lying about it. So... Um, how does one do that intentionally? Um, I, you, you, <clears throat> you have said this to me, that it probably is easier to crack this nut in a family. Okay? Mm. And, um, I, because, because I tend to think in terms of structures because I'm a teacher and so forth, I would like to see churches consciously craft some structures in how they do congregational care to make sure people don't fall out of cracks into the cracks and that there is there's a good mix of cross between married and single and across generations and so forth but if there's if there's an individual family out there <coughs> or someone in a family listening right now um look around you in your church or in your neighborhood um who do you see who as far as you know doesn't have a family now you might be concerned or even intimidated well that's a professional person that person's obviously very competent and has everything together and that might be but um i know i present really competent you do because i've had no choice i've had to do everything on my own for for 30 plus years and i'm exhausted and i'm also and if, yeah. if i could mm -hmm. say if we yeah. could peel back the matters mm -hmm. of your heart and let somebody actually see mm -hmm. What comes across as a very competent, capable lady, mm -hmm. there's some vulnerabilities here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. this hurts. Yeah. It, it hurts just for its own sake in a way I think anybody could understand, but also because I have over the years tried to say, hello, help, we need to address this, not just for me, but 
that I'm not the only person this is impacting. You know, I again, I don't know, know the numbers right off the top of my head, but let's say in 1960, two thirds of adults 18 and over were married. These days it's less than 50%. And the numbers are going down, down, down. And I, I have said for years, if we don't know how to enfold heterosexual single people, what are we going to have to offer LGBT single people? And and that I was asking that question long before it became, you know, a cultural hot button issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it is a cultural hot button issue. And and we're having to pay the price. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um and so the church, because it has not thought about what it means to support those God may in fact be calling to singleness, mm -hmm. um, is got you know, people like me, maybe people with LGBT um, attractions or concerns, maybe widows, maybe divorcees, maybe people who are saying, I come from a family of divorce, there's no way I'm getting married. We've got to stop and think about who are the people God has given us right now. And how do we make sure they're cared for and that they don't have to keep asking and asking and asking to be cared for? I, I'm afraid I don't ask for it a lot because it's humiliating. Mm. But I have asked regularly over the years. I have knocked on doors. I have had discussions. I've said, this is an issue. And by the way, I will, I, I'm willing to sit down and help you craft a way to help the church do this better. And I tend to get nods and smiles, but then nothing happens. I think because it's not immediately on their radar. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah. um, ra raising up the awareness mm -hmm. so that it is on radars. Mm -hmm. And while it would be wonderful to have structural change, and we would love to see that, again, Church Universal, mm -hmm. your Camille-spiration, <laughs> my Shanspiration, <laughs> is gosh guys let's go find a single person mm -hmm. and love on them mm -hmm. be the family of god mm -hmm. yeah yeah guys stay tuned because i have a sneaky suspicion mm -hmm. that there may be part two <laughs> part three part four and five to this discussion but camille thanks so much for being with us i'm real glad that you asked me thank you Thank you.